So we were talking about the high seas and the different provisions under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Now, this is a continuation again. We had stopped at this particular slide, that is at Article 110. We just finished Article 109, just some few minutes back. And now we are going to do uh, or study Article 110. Article 110 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea talks about the right of visit. Now, except where acts of interference derive from powers conferred by treaty or a warship which encounters on the high seas, a foreign ship other than the ship entitled to complete immunity in accordance with Articles 95 and 96, is not justified in boarding it unless there is a reasonable ground for suspecting that there is some kind of a piracy, that is a ship is engaged in piracy or the ship is engaged in slave trade or the ship is engaged in unauthorized broadcasting. So, or the ship is without nationality or the or though flying a foreign flag or refusing to show its flag, the ship is in reality of the same nationality as the warship. So, this article suggests that piracy is prohibited, slave trade is prohibited, unauthorized broadcasting is prohibited, then the ship must have a particular nationality and fly its flag, okay? And in case, and you know, refusing to show its flag and the flag documents again would go uh, against or is in contravention of the international laws and in is in contravention of this particular convention. Now, in the cases provided for in paragraph one, that is uh, one of article 110, cases that in the sense from A to E, in these circumstances, that is piracy, slave trade, unauthorized broadcasting, and a ship without nationality, and that the ship is refusing to show its flag and flag documents, then in these cases, the warship may proceed to verify the ship's right to fly to fly its flag. To this end, it may send a boat under the command of an officer to the suspected ship. In case of suspicion, then the, you know, the boat, a boat may be sent, a special boat may be sent under the command of an officer to check the suspected ship. If suspicion remains after the documents have been checked, it may proceed to further examination on board the ship which will be carried out with all possible consideration. Now, if the suspicions prove to be unfounded and provided that the ship boarded has not committed any act justifying them, it shall be compensated for any loss or damage that it might or may have sustained. These provisions apply mutadis mutandis. Now, what is mutadis mutandis? It's a Latin term, which means as per changing circumstances. That means these provisions are flexible and it is applicable as per the circumstances. When the circumstances changes, so it can be applied mutatis mutandis to the military aircraft. So these provisions, that means even a military aircraft can come and, you know, check um, any ship that is kind of, uh, you know, uh, where there is um, a you know, the, the, there is a, a, you know, kind of suspicion against a particular ship. And in case they have valid and reasonable suspicion, in fact, against a particular ship, then uh, a warship or even a military aircraft can go and, you know, conduct further examination, maybe on board the ship or even ask them to show relevant documents. Now, these provisions also apply to any other duty authorized ships or aircraft clearly marked and identifiable as being on government service. Article 111 talks about the right of hot pursuit. Now, the hot pursuit of a foreign ship may be undertaken when the competent authorities of the coastal state have good reason to believe that the ship has violated the laws and regulations of that state. Now, such pursuit must be commenced when the foreign ship or one of its boats is within the internal waters. 
the archipelagic waters, the territorial sea, or the contiguous zones of the pursuing state, and may only be continued outside the territorial sea or the contiguous zone if the pursuit has not been interrupted. So it is not necessary, in fact, that at the time when the foreign ship within the territorial sea or the contiguous zone receives the order to stop, the ship giving the order should likewise be within the territorial sea or the contiguous zone. If the foreign ship is within a contiguous zone as defined in Article 33 of the same convention, the pursuit may only be undertaken if there has been a violation of the rights for the protection of which the zone was established. Now, the right of hot pursuit should apply also, again, mutandis, mutandis, that is, it should adapt to changes, make changes as per the change. So to violations in the exclusive economic zones as well, or also on the continental shelf, including safety zones around continental shelf installations of the laws and regulations of the coastal state applicable in accordance with this convention to the exclusive economic zone or the continental shelf, including such safety zones. Now, the right of hot pursuit ceases as soon as the ship pursued enters the territorial sea of its own state or of a third state. So this is the right of hot pursuit and further, hot pursuit is not deemed to have been begun unless the pursuing ship has satisfied itself by such practicable means as may be available that the ship pursued or one of its boats or other craft working as a team and using the ship pursued as a mothership is within the limits of the territorial sea or as the case may be within the contiguous zones or the exclusive economic zones or above the continental shelf. So the pursuit may be only commenced after a visual or auditory signal to stop the ship has been given at a distance, which enables it to be seen or heard by the foreign ship. Now, this right may be exercised only by warships, mind you, or military aircraft, or other ships or aircraft clearly marked and identifiable as being on government service and authorized to that effect. So that means the right of hot pursuit can be exercised only by the government or by warships or by military aircraft or any ships or aircraft that you know clearly is marked as being on government service and it is authorized to that effect. Now, where hot pursuit is effected by an aircraft, the provision of paragraph, again, the upper paragraphs are clauses one to four shall apply mutandis, mutandis, mutatis, mutandis, that is make amends as per changing circumstances that is applicable as per the circumstance. The, the aircraft giving the order to stop must itself actively pursue the ship until a ship or another aircraft of the coastal state summoned by the aircraft arrives to take over the pursuit unless the aircraft is itself able to arrest the ship. It does not suffice to justify an arrest outside the territorial sea that the ship was nearly sighted by the aircraft as an offender or suspected offender if it was not both ordered to stop and pursued by the aircraft itself or other aircraft or ship which continues the pursuit without interruption. The release of a ship arrested within the jurisdiction of a state and escorted to a port of that state for that purpose of an inquiry before the competent authorities may not be claimed solely on the ground that the ship in the course of its voyage was escorted across a portion of the exclusive economic zone or the high seas if the circumstances rendered this necessary. Where a ship has been stopped or arrested outside the territorial sea in circumstances which do not justify the exercise of the right of hot pursuit, then it shall be compensated for any loss or damage that may have been thereby sustained. So this question or, uh, you know, there can be a question for your exams on the right of hot pursuit. This is something that is important. I want you to you know, make a note of that for your final exams. The right of hot pursuit can come as a short note. Please make a note of this in your notebooks or wherever you are, you know, take a note of it. So the right of hot pursuit can come as a short note for your final exams. Okay?
and this is a very very important chapter so uh, 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 you know a long question or an essay type of question for 20 marks can come on this entire chapter that is the high seas and the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Like you'll have to mention all these articles that are important. Now, Article 112 talks about the right to lay submarine cables and pipelines. Now, all states are entitled to lay submarine cables and pipelines on the bed of the high seas beyond the continental shelf. Now, Article 79, in fact, paragraph 5 applies to such cables and pipelines. So what does Article 79 uh, clause, subclause 2 say? It stipulates that subject to its right to take reasonable measures for the exploration of the continental shelf, the exploitation of its natural resources, and the prevention, reduction, and control of pollution from pipelines, the coastal state may not impede or may not obstruct or may not stop, obstruct, impede the laying or maintenance of such cables or pipelines. It's a cross-reference also to Article 4 of the Law of the Sea of Convention, where this principle was originally crafted and incorporated in the draft. This is Article 112 of United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. As you know, there was an earlier convention prior to the convention, which was there in the 1980s, there was a convention in 1950s, that is a law of the sea convention, LOSC. So if you do a cross reference there to Article 4, in Article 4, it's where, I mean, you would find the connection there. And, you know, this principle of laying submarine cables and pipelines was originally crafted and incorporated in the draft of L. OSC Article 4. Now, 130 talks about breaking or injury of a submarine cable or pipeline. What happens if a pipeline breaks, which are laid under the high seas? Now, every state shall adopt the laws and regulations necessary pro to provide that breaking or injury by a ship flying its flag or by a person subject to its jurisdiction of a submarine cable beneath the high seas is done willfully or through culpable negligence in case there is it is willfully done or the, there is culpable negligence in such a manner as to be liable to interrupt or obstruct telephonic or telegraphic communications and similarly the breaking or injury of a submarine pipeline or high voltage power cable shall be a punishable offense so this provision shall apply also to conduct calculated to conduct calculated I'm sure you know the difference between conduct and conduct. That is the action to action calculated. Conduct is action, um, you know, to conduct calculated or action calculated or likely to result in such a breaking or injury. However, it shall not apply to any break or injury caused by persons who acted merely with the legitimate object of saving their lives or their ships after having taken all necessary precautions to avoid such a break or injury. Article 114 talks about breaking or injury by owners of a submarine cable or pipeline of another submarine cable or pipeline. Now, every state shall adopt the laws and regulations that are necessary to provide that if persons subject to its jurisdiction who are owners of a submarine cable or pipeline beneath the high seas is laying or repairing that cable or pipeline cause a break or injury to another cable or pipeline, then they shall bear the cost of repairs that is the one who has caused the break or caused the injury to that particular cable or pipeline shall bear the cost of what? Of repairs. Now, Article 115 talks about indemnity for the loss incurred in avoiding injury to a submarine cable or pipeline. Now, what happens if they have tried to avoid an injury and in the pursuit of avoiding injury, there is some loss that has incurred to the person or to the ship. So how, so how are they going to make good the loss? So they're going to indemnify the loss, that is to make good the loss or they are compensated for the loss. So every state shall adopt the laws and regulations necessary to ensure that the owners of the ship 
who can prove that they have sacrificed an anchor, a net or any other fishing gear in order to avoid injuring a submarine cable or pipeline shall be indemnified by the owner of the cable or pipeline provided that the owner of the ship has taken all reasonable precautionary measures beforehand. Now let's move on to part two of part seven of this convention, which deals with conservation of living resources in the high seas, living resources such as fish, mammals, sea animals. So article 116 talks about the right to fish on the high sea. All states have the right for their nationals to engage in fishing on the high sea subject to their treaty obligations the rights and duties as well as the interests of the coastal states provided for inter alia in article 63 paragraph 2 and 64 to 67 and the provisions of the section they give right to fishing on the high sea so right to fishing comes under article 116 of the united nation convention on the law of the sea article 117 talks about the duty of the states to adopt national measures for the conservation of living resources of the high sea. All states have the duty to take or to co cooperate with other states in taking such measures for their respective nationals as may be necessary for the conservation of the living resources of the high sea. And 118 talks about cooperation of the states in the conservation and management of living resources. States shall cooperate with each other for the conservation and management of living resources. That is the nations should cooperate with one another for the purpose of conservation and management of the living resources in the high seas where national na nations, its nations can exploit identical living resources or different living resources in the same area. They shall enter into negotiations with a view to take the measures necessary for conservation or protection of the living resources concerned. So they shall, as appropriate, cooperate to establish sub-regional or regional fisheries organization to this end. 119 specifically talks about conservation of living resources of the high seas again, and in determining the allowable catch and establishing conservation measures for the living resources on the high seas, the states shall take all measures that are possible uh, in, a, in a way that is designed with best scientific evidence available to the states concerned to maintain or restore populations of harvested species at levels which can produce the maximum sustainable yield as qualified by relevant environmental and economic factors. And also take into consideration the effect on species that are associated with or which are dependent upon harvested species with a view to maintaining or restoring populations of such associated or dependent species above levels at which their reproduction may be seriously threatened. For the available scientific information, catch and fishing effort statistics and other data relevant to the conservation of fish stocks shall be contributed and exchanged on a regular basis. Article 120 talks about the protection of marine mammals and Article 65, there is, you can do a cross-reference there, which deals with the conservation and management of marine mammals in the high seas. And lastly, Article 100 to Article 108 and 110, it deals with piracy, which will be discussed in the next chapter. So this is all that we have done today, the freedom of navigation, and we have studied, um, you know, relevant provisions of United Nations Convention on the law of the sea on the high seas or the international waters. Uh, just please write your names in the chat box for your attendance.
And also I'd like to, um, uh, you know, remind you of your assignments and the due date for it is tomorrow. And yet another thing is um, you can have a question for your final exams. I mean, a question can come on the right of fishing on the high seas. So what would be your answer? Right of fishing on the high seas, okay? That would come as a short note, say for around five marks. It can be five or it can be 10 marks that I will let you know later. But this is also one of you know uh, the important questions that can come for your final exams. So, so far I've said that right of hot pursuit is an important question. It can come for your short note. Right of fishing on the high sea can come for your short notes. And this chapter as a whole can come as an essay type of question for 20 marks. That is the high seas and the provisions of United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea pertaining to the high seas. So the question can be like this, explain in detail the provisions of the United Nations Convention of Law of the Sea pertaining to the high seas. So that means this is the answer. Okay, so that's all for this class. I'm repeating again. Suppose there is a question or a, like a short note, write, short, write a short note on the right to fish or the right of fishing. So you're going to mention that it comes under Article 116 of the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. It comes under Section 2, Part F of the UNCLOS. And you're going to mention this provision. You're going to explain it. And also you're going to make mention of Article 63, Paragraph 2, Article 64, 267. That means 64, 65, 66, and 67, right? You'll have to refer to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea for these particular articles. So this is it. So meet your next class. Let me know if you have any questions.